Yes, so I am associate professor in economics in AgroParisTech. You know, in France, we have a specialized agronomic university. So uh, all what is related to environment and agronomy and uh, food sciences and so on are um, concentrated in some uh, university, agronomic university, and uh, the one of uh, Paris, uh, this is it, uh, AgroParisTech. And um, what I could say about me also, so uh, I am also, um, I worked in uh, agronomic sciences and also in economic sciences, so I have a, a double formation, a double um, yeah, formation, yeah. okay. And uh, you will see that uh, I am very involved into the common agricultural policy um, analysis, but also I was involved um, into the expertise for uh, some NGOs and also farm organizations. And um, among, uh, among uh, many things, uh, we wrote with, uh, with a colleague a report uh, on the, for the, all the NG environmental and uh, international NGOs and also little farms organization for uh, the last uh, common agricultural policy reform. And uh, I, will sp uh, I, I will speak on the base of it. But anyway, what I would like to, um, to, to present today is uh, more generally, what is this ag common agricultural policy? Uh, what are the stakes? And um, what is the development of this policy? Um, I don't know if you have knowledge about food and agricultural policies and economics. Yeah, some of you. Yeah, also. And um, yeah, what I could say before all is that today, uh, you know, agricultural and food policy are very important. And in the history, um, uh, agricultural markets was, were very regulated in many countries. Why? Because uh, there is a stake of food security. And this is a very uh, important stake for the states. And, but since I would say 30 or 40 years, uh, agricultural markets are more and more deregulated in the neoliberal period, you know. But since I would say five years, something like that, there is a feedback of the regulation. Or uh, some countries are trying again to regulate agricultural markets and to, um, um, to have some objectives of food autonomy. But this is very new because of the decreasing and the big volatility of food prices and farm prices. And you know that uh, farmers, this is the first uh, activity uh, in the world. You know that perhaps a third of uh, or half of the population live uh, from, food ag from, from farm activity in the world. This is, uh, uh, and this is a huge stake. And especially in countries like India, in Africa, in Asia, in uh, Latin America, there are still many, many farmers. And so uh, there is a big problem now because the prices, the farm prices, the prices for the farmers, uh, the food prices are more and more decreasing and more and more um, changing because of the deregulation of markets. So. Uh, big countries like Russia, like uh, Indonesia, uh, China, India, and so on, these countries, and also United States, um, are thinking, well, perhaps we, we, we were uh, too, we, we went too far in the deregulation of markets. And perhaps we should again regulate agricultural markets and uh, we should say, uh, we, we should not try to be, uh, to, to respect all the WTO rules and uh, we should perhaps uh, fix more prices, fix more exchanges and trade and so on, okay? 
But what I would like to present here is a European policy. And this is very interesting because the European Union is in a very, very neoliberal spirit, you know. And so <coughs> in the European Union, there is no, um, th they don't take into account this problem and they continue to deregulate market as if uh, the market would be so very good for everyone, you know. And I, I will, uh, I, I am presenting how it, uh, it's changing and uh, what are the limits of this deregulation of markets, okay? So, um, first of all, uh, I'm presenting the challenges for a new European farm and food policy. What for the NGOs, for the little farms, associations, organizations, what is very important for us? What is, uh, what is the problem, okay? And then I will present the common agricultural policy and how it changed, uh, it changed in, the, in the history. First of all, um, what we could say about the agri-food agri trade balance uh, for the European Union. Anyway, this is clear that we have a positive, not very positive, but a positive agri-food trade balance for European Union. And um, this agri-food trade balance is more and more positive for the EU. So we could say, okay, that's fine. Um, economically uh, speaking, okay? But there is a problem because there is a very unbalanced trade, bal um, uh, trade balance now with especially sizable imports of fruits and oleaginous crops from South Africa. Uh, fruits, uh, we will see that later. Oleaginous crops from South Africa, this is linked to a decision in the 60s years, okay, uh, in... Um, 62, I think, uh, there was a decision in the EU, this was a compromise with the United States. The United States said, okay, we let you implement a very strong common agricultural policy, but you have uh, to make this appear um, uh, every, um, every import uh, barrier, okay, for uh, the soya, especially. And uh, since this period, we are very, very dependent to South America and to United States for all the soya and uh, for all the, wh what we do with the soya, you know? Is well, yes, poultry, cows and so on, it's for the animal food, you know? And the problem is that it changes the way of feeding the animal of feeding the animal, okay? Because before, we used much grazing for the animal, which tried to be the more natural and environmental friendly way of feeding the animal. But as the soya arrived at very low prices from United States and Latin America after, we changed little, uh, progressively our way for feeding the animal in France, in EU, because of this decision of um, decreasing and make disappear our barrier at the European frontier, okay? And so now we use soya, we use maize, and animal don't pasture uh, anymore, or in, or in many farms they don't pasture anymore. Sometimes yes, but less and less. And we, um, uh, we use now this soya and this maize for feeding animals. And this has also many environmental consequences in Latin America, you know. Uh, I know from some of you come from Latin America. Okay, so, you know, I, I think you know this problem. You are wh from where? Brazil. Brazil, so. <laughs> this is our first uh, exporter, our, our first exporter for soya. <laughs> also, yeah. Uh, Argentina, okay, so these are the two, uh, <laughs> two main countries <laughs> for exporting soda to EU and other countries. And you know that there are consequences on the deforestation uh, and the way of producing soya in Latin America has many environmental consequences because these this are very monoculture, very, very um, big, huge monocultures. 
And uh, so because of this decision in 1962, um, no, uh, now we are very dependent for this oleaginous crops and soya from South America, which is GMO uh, soya anyway. And uh, so that's the problem. European citizens don't want GMOs, but <laughs> we are obliged to import GMO soya for feeding animals. Population don't know that, but we feed animals with GMO especially. And, and <coughs> um, so uh, very unbalanced trade, bal uh, trade balance, you, you see that here. Here, uh, thanks to the wine, we are, an, we are exporter towards the world, but this is especially thanks to the wine and alcohol in, in Europe. But uh, if we uh, if we don't ha uh, if we uh, don't take it to account, uh, wine and alcohol, we are very importer, a net importer from the rest of the world. Okay, and uh, this is wine and uh, tabac. I don't know how it is. Yeah, tobacco. Yes. <laughs> so tobacco and wine, which is not a very food product anyway. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you know, here this is uh, fruits, vegetables. So we import more and more fruits and vegetables, and soya here. No. Um, so the two big uh, products which which are imported. Okay. Uh, I can send to you the the PowerPoint if you want to. Okay. Uh, second stake, this is it. Food security means also affordable prices for consumers, okay? And what we can see here is that these food prices decreased uh, until uh, 2000, okay? But now this is quite stable. Anyway, you can see here the prices for farmers in EU. Uh, this is the France especially, but anyway, this is quite the same in all country, EU countries. Here you can see the farm prices. And there is a big gap, an increasing gap, between the prices for farmers and the prices which we pay for our food, you know? And uh, how we can explain that? Anyway, we could say uh, there are more processing and distribution costs, okay? That is what... Uh, the, the big enterprises, uh, uh, the big processing and distribution enterprises say this is because of costs, because uh, of our costs. But if we see uh, more precisely what is happening, uh, this is clearly not the case, the, the, the reason. The reason is that they can make pressure on prices because they are more and they are bigger and bigger. And uh, they are now in a situation of oligopol, yeah. And uh, so personally, I uh, I worked a lot on milk sector, and this, there are there is clearly an oligopol in the in the sector of processing and distribution uh, enterprises. Okay. For example, for the distribution in the supermarkets, there are now four or five enterprises in France. That, that all. That is uh, only four or five, and the rest is very marginal. Okay. So uh, clearly, there is a distribution of uh, added value more and more in favor of these processing and distribution enterprises. Okay. Uh, thanks to a pressure on farm prices. And uh, the fact is that, you know, the prices don't cover the cost of production now. This is clearly the case. And you will see, if we make disappear uh, the subsidies for farmers, uh, they have very, very negative incomes. And it's not possible for them to live for, the, for most of the farms in the EU or at least in France, this is not possible to maintain the farm. So that is why in EU we have so uh, big subsidies for farms. You will see this is, in France, this is 90% uh, of the farm income, of the national farm income, 
is covered by direct subsidies, 90%. Um, also, nutritional and health programs. Uh, you know that there is an even more consumption of processed food products with large quantities of sugar and fat. And there are increasing problems of obesity. Any way we will see that uh, there are still many subsidies, direct subsidies for sugar sector. And uh, there is uh, clearly a problem of uh, nutritional policies uh, which counter um, lobbies from, uh, from, uh, from agro-industry. There is a massive use of, of pesticides, and uh, uh, this is only since uh, for a few years that it is recognized, especially for the farmers. The, uh, you know that the farmers are the first victims of the pesticides, and... Uh, all the chemic chemical produ products which are used in the field. Uh, but this is, um, uh, this is recognized, but very progressively. And uh, especially in the, um, especially from uh, the, the social security or the, yeah, uh, from the state. So, you know, for reimbursing and from, uh, in, uh, uh, from for reimbursing or from for compensating the farmers which are victims from from that and anyway we know that uh, there is no decreasing real decreasing of this use of pesticides now uh, this is stabilizing but this is not decreasing and there are stronger concerns on quality of safety food that is a paradox Consumers wa want more and more quality and safety food, but uh, there is no real pro uh, progress. Employment and farm incomes, uh, just, uh, just to have an idea, after the Second World War, a third of the f population in France was composed of fa farmers. Now this is 3%. This is... Uh, I think there is no other sector in the world which knew a so a strong decreased, decreasing of employment. And seen, uh, <coughs> I would say for 30 years, uh, so you know, during this period, uh, almost, um, almost 50,000 employments were destroyed per year in France. This is... Uh, more or less the same as uh, the industrial sector. Okay, this is a silent revolution, um, but uh, they are, uh, th th this is a, a real destroying of employment. And this is only in France, but I don't know if some of them come from other European countries. Yeah. Which one? I what? I come from Italy. Okay. In Italy, is the same. I think you have perhaps uh, six or seven percent in farm sector now, not three, but this is the same percent of uh, de of decreasing. Other countries from east, from east, perhaps? No, I know. From where? Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. Okay, I could say you have. Oh, okay, that's very interesting. We will speak about your European Commissioner of Agriculture, which is Irish. Who is Irish? Anyway, I'm not uh, very... Uh, okay, I will speak about that. <laughs> this is a very big problem, I think. <laughs> but I will explain why. I will explain why. Not, this is not the problem, is the guy. And um, Okay, but I will speak about that. And uh, the interest of Irish sector, agricultural sector, uh, is... Um, really opposed to the one of France, for example, and I will explain why. <coughs> um, a rap rapid disappearing of farm. Uh, there is a concentration of land and capital in even larger farms, you know. And uh, for example, there, are more, there were more of two millions of farms uh, after the Second World War in France. Now, uh, five uh, hundred of thousands. So, and half of farms disappeared in the last 20 years, okay? But this is the same in the all EU countries, 
okay, in Italia, in Ireland also, in every country in EU. And uh, the problem is that um, you will, uh, we are going to see that here, in some countries, uh, there remains many farmers. Here you have the, po the, the part of farms, uh, or the primary sector, not only the farms, the fish sector also, but this is uh, mainly the farm employment. So you, will, you, are, uh, you see that in Romania, for example, there is uh, almost half, half of the population is of primary sector, and especially, you know, in the farm sector. Uh, so 40% of employments are in the farm sector now, in Romania. But the problem is that uh, uh, the prices, the international um, competition and so on, uh, is making pressure on these farms and they are disappearing very, very quickly, you know? But the problem is that in Romania, you know, you have 10% of uh, unemployment. So, uh, what we do with all uh, these farms which disappear? What are going to make the people? Because there is no uh, employment for these people, okay? So this is a big problem of employment in, in Romania, or you see that in Greece. In Greece, oh, this is not 25 because there is a fish sector also, this is 25% uh, more or less of people which are farmers, who are farmers in Greece. And this country is in the middle of a big crisis with 20% of unemployment or more, I think so. What we do with all this, uh, um, all these uh, workers or Unemploy, uh, unemployed, uh, unemployed people, okay? So what I want to say is that the farm sector plays still a role for, for employing people, but there is a, uh, a trend to make disappear all these, um, all these uh, employments. <coughs> so what about all farms and all farmers in South and Eastern European countries? and especially subsistent and semi-subsistent farms. These are very little farms, which play a role for uh, feeding people, or, you know, for um, uh, bringing food to the families and uh, the villages, okay? They are disappearing uh, now in these uh, eastern and southern countries of EU, uh, and what uh, what about all these farmers in the context of mass employment, unemployment? Uh, the children of these people which are not uh, continuing uh, the, the, the activity of the parents, uh, what we do with them uh, in this context of mass unemployment? So here you have uh, the size of the farms in EU. You can see that this is very different according to um, to the countries and the region. Here you have farms that are more than uh, 50 hectares. I, uh, yeah, in Ireland this is not so, 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 may, so, so big, finally. Um, but also so in all the north and uh, west Europe. And you know that in Romania, for example, the average size of farm is less than Five hectares, okay? Five hectares, this is uh, like a terrain de foot, uh, football uh, surface, you know? This is one hectare, okay? Uh, so five hectares, this is very bi uh, little farms, but they are very important for, um, for, for the social living of, uh, of these farmers, okay? Or the social conditions. Uh, problems also of incomes, of farm incomes. This is the development of farm incomes uh, in, um, in France here. You can see that uh, this farm income is, uh, okay, this is increasing. Anyway, uh, this is not in uh, constant terms, so you have to take into account the, the inflation, okay? But anyway, what you can see is that the income is more and more unstable. You see that? 
And now the problem of farm, for farmers is that they, they have an income which can be, uh, which can be reduced uh, or which can increase very uh, quickly. And uh, this, is a, this is also a big problem. And also uh, an income which highly depends on direct subsidies. I, I said that. And uh, for example, in France, this is 30,000 euros per farm per year of subsidies, but with very strong inequalities between farms and production. For example, in France, the level of poverty in the, in the agricultural sector is much bigger than the other uh, economic sectors. Finally, environmental changes. You know that around 10% of Europe's greenhouse gas emission come from agriculture, especially methane and nitrous oxide emissions. And also there is an increased use of fossil energy in agriculture. So, um, but uh, be careful because there is a responsibility, especially of the pro farm production, with which, which we can call an intensive production. This is a production of crops on very large surfaces without rotations, uh, in monoculture, uh, with ma many chemical products, and in the livestock, uh, okay? This is uh, uh, the farm production with many um, animals per hectare, with maize, soya, you know, and, uh, and uh, without grassland. So negative impacts of intensive farming on biodiversity, water quality, and for example, in France, but also in Ireland or in, uh, in uh, Germany, in north of Germany or in uh, Netherlands or in Denmark, we are uh, today, we are unable to respect the European directives of nitri on nitrates, on phosphates and so on in the water because of this intensification of livestock. And uh, very regularly in France, but also in all the countries I, I, I mentioned, we have uh, the European Commission which go to the country and say, OK, we, you are unable to respect it. You, want to, you, you have to respect it, and we, we have uh, bills to pay and so on uh, because of that. Soil quality. Uh, there is also a big problem because of decreasing of organic matter, of crop rotation, and so on. And uh, all of this is uh, due to uh, changing ways of producing, so decreasing of grassland area. <coughs> In many countries, uh, the countries uh, I mentioned, there is, uh, perhaps except Ireland, there is a big decreasing of grassland, but we will speak about uh, Ireland after. <laughs> Uh, we have a big decreasing of grassland, specialization of farms as regions. For example, you know that around Paris, you have only crops. The livestock is decreasing, but there is a problem because there is no organic matter for the, for the crops. And so what we use for compensating the, 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 the lack of organic matter? The organic matter, this is... Um, uh, ah, comment on appelle ça? Je vais le retrouver. Uh, yes, this is the, uh, comment on appelle les fluents d'élevage. Ah, je ne sais plus, c'est pas grave. Uh, so, you know what is the organic matter? This is what comes from uh, the livestock, you know? Yeah. What? The manure. Yeah. The manure, okay? Uh, and how we do when we ha do not have livestock in the territory? for feeding uh, the crops with organic matter, which uh, you know that it uh, brings um, nitrogen, okay? And plants need nitrogen. So how we do, and we do not have this organic matter in the crops, we use what? Fertilizers. fertilizers, chemical fertilizers. So the problem is that in a regions like uh, around Paris, we do not have livestock anymore because all livestock is concentrating in the, in the west of France, you know, in Brittany, in uh, Normandy and so on. Okay, so what we use around Paris, we use more and more chemical fertilizers, okay? 
yeah, I have to be careful. <coughs> And uh, there is also less crops rotation, less hedges, less trees, and so on. Finally, how, uh, how much time do I have? 15 minutes, this is awful, but I will try to respect it. Mm -hmm. Short history of the cap and lessons to be learned. So the, the question is, what is the responsibility of the common agricultural policy uh, for all of this? You know that the common agricultural policy was implemented just at the beginning of the European uh, community, the European, uh, um, sp um, yeah, the, construction, the, the building of the European Union. And uh, th there was only six member states at the beginning, you know. And just at the beginning, the common agricultural policy was really uh, the, um, the peer of the, the you, you understand the peer? The peer? Yeah. Right. Uh, the foundation, you know, of, the, uh, of this European community. And uh, there was, uh, it was decided to have a common market of agricultural goods. This is that there is no barrier between uh, European countries uh, at all, but there is also a common agricultural policy you know, and the common external trade policies, that is, we negotiate all together uh, how we um, trade all the products uh, at the European frontiers, okay? And this common agricultural policy, there was the idea, very important idea, and it was in a Fordist period, in a Keynesian period, you know, where, where the states was important for regulating markets, and there was this big idea that we cannot let uh, the, <coughs> the prices uh, vary according to the, the international markets. It was really the first idea, because the international prices are not good for the, for, um, um, uh, for, uh, the welfare of, of everyone. <coughs> so, uh, we have to uh, disconnect, disconnect, disconnect uh, <coughs> this, uh, the, the European prices and the world prices. So, market is not an adequate instrument for the long-term management <coughs> of agricultural supply. And so, we need a strong public action on prices for increasing productivity of agriculture. You know, it was a period when we had very uh, big problems for... F for um, for food security, and just after the Second World War, huh, there, there, were, there were big problems because the war uh, destroyed uh, uh, our capacities uh, for, uh, for producing food. And uh, so we needed uh, a strong policy uh, for increasing productivity of labor in agricultural sector, for ensuring fair life condition, uh, for ensuring reasonable prices and guaranteed food security. It is uh, really, it, this were the objective, the first objective of the common agricultural policy. And uh, how we did that? Uh, here you have uh, the world price, okay? Very, uh, very unstable because of many reasons. Uh, I, I do not have the time to explain, but in rural economy, agricultural economics, this is proved that if you don't regulate these prices, they are very unstable because of um, uh, market disturbances or market imperfections. So very uh, uh, volatile, unstable prices. And how we disconnect uh, the European prices? Thanks to guaranteed prices. When, when this price uh, decrease, the European price. What we do here? You know that? This is still the case in India, for example. In some countries, they, they still use this uh, kind of farm policy, of food policy. What we do here for making the price uh, increase again? You buy the products and store them? Well, uh, yeah. So, stockage. Yeah. Uh, stockage? No, you say. Storage, yeah, storage. Storage, yeah, public storage. So EU, European Union, buy, um, European Union uh, buy uh, this product 
in public storage, and so the price can increase again. And when it increases, we can uh, again sell the, the products which are storaged. Okay? But also, we had uh, very efficient uh, and variable custom duties. And these custom duties uh, varied according to the level of the world prices. Okay? And export subsidies also. So we can sell the products uh, at the world price and not at the European price. This was a way of uh, dumping, anyway. Yeah? And also, we, uh, so we made that for some strategic productions, crop, sugar, comic, meat products, and so on. And uh, we had also policy for uh, investments uh, in the farms for um, uh, so many, uh, many measures also for uh, reinforcing familial farms, but bigger uh, familial farms, okay? So, uh, what, uh, wh what we did with that, we, we managed to increase investments, and uh, there was a very uh, strong uh, labor increased productivity. There is an increased production also, uh, the production was doubled in 50 years, uh, more or less, uh, in an era when the rest of the economy needed worker. Anyway, in this period, this was not seen as a problem, the, dec the decreasing numbers of farmers, because there was a need for other sectors, which is not the case now. Decreasing uh, stabilized food prices and so on. However, there were limits. An increased agricultural production in other parts of the world and stagnation of world demand and exchanges during the, the, during the 70s. The 70s, yeah. Uh, there was an increased import of soya, I said that before. And uh, finally, it worked too much. It, it worked so that we had many surpluses um, after, the, the, after the 70s and, the, and, the, and the, the 80s. And so that there were budgetary tension because um, it costed to, uh, make, um, to make increase uh, the, uh, the subsidies for exports. So that, that, that we, we were obliged to implement milk quotas, for example, measures for limiting production. Also, there, were all, uh, there, were the, the, there was the growing UK hostility faced to the common agricultural policy. The United Kingdom was a new country in uh, 73, you know, and the UK uh, was very hostile face, face to the common agricultural policy because this is, a hist this is a country which is liberal historically and they didn't like uh, the common agricultural policy and demanded to reform it very quickly. Especially this is, there is a very well-known well uh, sentence from Margaret Thatcher which, who say, uh, uh, I want my money back. This was uh, oriented towards the common agricultural policy. She said that because she, uh, she thought that the common agricultural policy was, just, uh, uh, was not useful and that the uh, uh, UK must be reinforced because of the CIP. There was also growing hostility from USA and export countries because as the common agricultural policy worked too much, other countries were not happy because uh, there was a problem of uh, competition with EU. And also we were uh, newly in a period of liberal economic <coughs> policy in the, in the 80s, so that more and more the EU arrived to, uh, to, an, uh, to a big reform of the common agricultural policy in 92. 
which was a preparation for the WTO agreement of 94. You know that this is the last uh, big agreement of WTO. There is uh, not a new one, okay? But this WTO agreement was really important for explaining um, uh, how to say that? To, to explain uh, a big change of agriculture policies in the northern countries, okay? Because this WTO agreement obliged to decrease strongly all the measures I explained before. Agriculture, um, export subsidies, uh, guaranteed price, and, uh, and so on. Oh, I, okay. <coughs> um, so what we do, finally, and uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five minutes. What, what, we, what did we do, finally, in EU? We decided to make disappear the guaranteed prices, okay? And so what was the result? We make, uh, we, we, we linked the European and the international prices. So now we have no disconnection between the European and the world prices. And all European prices paid to the farmers vary according to the international markets, which are more and more volatile. For, why are they more and more unstable at the world level? Because every country, every big country and exporter decided to make it. So now, uh, except perhaps China with the cereals, there is no big country and exporter which have storage, public storage, which regulate prices and so on. And as every country deregulate its market, you know, it, make, uh, it makes uh, very, uh, it, it makes, uh, it led to, uh, to an increased um, uh, variation of, of world prices. You understand that? Okay. And what we do in, in Europe for compensating this decrease of prices, of EU prices, we compensated it in the form of direct payments. Okay? Very big direct payments because the prices in EU are very low and very uh, unstable now. Uh, so, uh, what could I say now? So now we have uh, no tools for regulating prices, no tools for regulating volumes. We tried to answer to the environmental effects of agriculture because after 80 there was more and more critics from the society to the agriculture because of the environment. So we tried to, uh, uh, to create measures uh, agro-environmental measures, some measures for taking into account the environment, but anyway, this is uh, uh, very marginal. And I would say just a, f a point, now in France, uh, a, a, a PhD student presented its work uh, last year. Uh, um, the result is that in France, um, if you have, um, when a farm have the best practices in environment, she received the less, subsi less subsidies, okay? And on the contrary, more and more our practices are uh, uh, wrong for the environment, more and more you receive subsidies per hectare. The same is for the work. More and more you maintain the work or you have uh, uh, workers per hectare, less and less you receive subsidies. There is a, co uh, there is a link uh, between uh, your practices and your amount of subsidies, but is not in favor of work and in favor of, um, not in favor of employment and not in favor of environment because of many choices in the history for um, uh, distributing these payments. 
So now, which problems do we ha have? High farm prices volatility, prices well below the cost production for most of the production, subsidies which, which do not vary according farm revenues, farm employment, and environmental services. On the contrary, <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a negative link. High inequalities of distribution at the expense of farm with the best environmental good practices, of farm maintaining employment better than the others, of some products like fruits and vegetables, for example, or, uh, for example fruits uh, do not uh, touch any subsidies, but they have a very nutritional value, and at the expense of southern and poorest countries, because we oblige these countries to open their barrier, and we distribute many subsidies to our farms, and so this is also a, a way of dumping now. And uh, you know that uh, there was um, a complaint, uh, a, a, plant, a complaint from some poor, poorest and southern countries against the EU and the United States because of their subsidies. So which le legitimacy? This is a big question. And uh, what we could propose, or uh, what we propose as, uh, what propose the environmental and, and so solidarity NGOs and so on, they propose tools for regulating markets, again, storage and prices management, at least direct subsidies according to the farm revenues, tools for regulating production volumes, but also keeping strong border measures, strong environmental conditions for receiving subsidies, Subsidies are located per worker and not per hectare, which will be in favor of employment. Strong subsidies for changing fra pra farm practices, organic farming, direct short supply chains, and so on, especially for the school meals. That is what, what is uh, done in the uh, in United States. You know that United States, uh, they, uh, they have a strong uh, specific policy for uh, having a preference, preference, yeah, uh, a preference towards the local and quality products. But you know that this is not allowed in EU because of the, uh, of the law of uh, competition. For example, you know, a town, a, a town, a, a city has not the right to prefer local products for its uh, school meals because of the European Union law. This is completely uh, on my mind. Uh, um, uh, this, this, this is really uh, uh, not uh, intelligent. But anyway, because of the competition law, we, do, we cannot uh, make it in EU. And in Canada, <coughs> we, dis we, we made pressure on the Canada uh, in the bilateral agreement for um, um, for pre for preventing this in Canada, you know, so you know it. But anyway, and, and Canada had a, a, a very strong policy for preferring the local products in the school meals, for example, university uh, restaurant and so on. And we obliged Canada to make it disappear in the bilateral agreement with them. So that's it. Uh, s I was good with the time, sorry. So uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, uh, just a, a point on the Irish, because I, I, Irish commissioner. I was councillor for the, the, for the president commissioner, Sulos, Dacian Sulos. Because he, yeah, I, I knew it from here because he made his study uh, uh, he stood, stood died in, uh, in Montpellier, in France, and so on. And uh, he had a really, uh, he really wanted to take into account the environment and the little farms because it's Romania. In Romania, it's con he, his country, there are very uh, many uh, uh, little farms. So it was really interesting because he tried to, to change the common agricultural policy. Anyway, he did. He just managed to ma make some pro little progress. But the problem is that the Irish commissioner now, Phil Hogan, um, its country, his country, 
Uh, this is a country with the lowest cost of production in milk, uh, in milk production. So he's, he thinks market is great and we will be the last one uh, surviving anyway. This is really, it. Uh, so he was really uh, against the meat quotas and or any regulation of markets. He said always, no, there is no crisis. Yeah, there is no crisis for the Irish farmers. Anyway, there was a, a, a also a crisis for the Irish farmers, but not so, uh, s uh, not as for the others. And so this is a very big problem with this commissioner on my mind, because this is a very liberal and productivist view. And uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I am very critic, uh, critical, and I think this is, uh, you, you know that in, fr in EU, in European Union, there is a problem because the European Commission, this is, they are not elected people, but they propose all laws to the European Parliament and, uh, and the, the countries, the ministers. And so if the commissioner decides uh, to uh, present this law or this one, uh, after uh, it has a, a, a big influence on what will be decided uh, finally. And so the influence and the power of the commissioner is quite big. And now we have a very big problem with, oh, we, oui, Frenchies, anyway, because uh, you know, Frenchies have a, a more regulated way of thinking the CIPs and the others. And uh, NG environmental NGOs and so on are very um, upset by the commissioner because he has <laughs> no environmental conscience. Um, yeah, it's clear. The, 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 there is a proposal, a communication of the European commissioner for the next reform. And it's awful. It's awful. He says, uh, we must, uh, as we have many differences between countries, every country has to decide its environmental uh, ways of producing. So everyone has to decide how uh, the, the regulation for environment and for social rules and so on. So yeah, naturally, it will be the, the social, environmental and fiscal dumping in the EU. And environmental, uh, on the environmental, uh, um, for the environment especially, and for the regulation of markets, this is awful. Hopefully, he will be. Uh, he will. I hope uh, he will uh, finish its uh, mandate uh, in two years. Uh, anyway, I. Uh, yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> anyway, we are very uh, in a very bad situation because of that. It's not uh, only because of that, but anyway, it, don't hel it doesn't help. So I really regret the last commissioner, but anyway. <laughs> Did he have the power alone to, to veto like, proposals? He had? Did he have the power himself to veto proposals? Yeah, uh, he has to make, uh, in to take into account the advices or the position of other countries. But he has a room of maneuver anyway. So he has always a, a, rules of, a, a room of maneuver. So. He cannot make what he wants, but he can uh, he can play with uh, all the positions. And uh, anyway, he decided not to take into account the environment. That's clear. And he decided that the market is great. That's clear. So now we have to make with it. <laughs> and as we do not have a, a real. Uh, as we do not have a you know, government in French, which is for the regulation of markets, you know, <laughs> as Ma Macron uh, is really uh, liberal also, uh, all the balance of power is not uh, towards the regulation of markets. There is also a, a problem, this is a problem of UK. Yes, UK is very liberal, so, but it was also a country which has had a very strong position of environment because of bird life, because of very strong NGOs in UK. For example, bird life, you know, this is two, uh, two millions of members in UK, two millions of members in bird life. So this has, a, you, you know it, I, I, I think so. For us in French, this is uh, amazing. So, you know, two millions in one organization, uh, this is amazing, especially for the birds. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, no, this is not only for the birds, this is for the biodiversity <coughs> and so on. But he has, it, has a a, it had in Brussels a, a very strong uh, power. Uh, it was a strong lobby. Now, as UK is, uh, is uh, out, uh, I think that these environmental NGOs will have uh, a, a, lowest, a lower uh, power. And this is not good for the environmental uh, side. <coughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, me, Jinan Shuech, and uh, Kasper, I'm from Bahrain, he, he's from Netherlands. We will have about discussion proposal for a new European agriculture and food policy. Uh, in our outline, we will first have a summary, and then we will have a discussion and the questions where, where we will raise many debates. First, uh, in the summary, you have the history and the overview of the CAF. First, you have the 1962, and then you have the 1992. And the first one, you have the birth of go uh, common agriculture policy, uh, where you have income supports for farmers, minimum of rices, and uh, production surplus. In the 1992, you have reform focused on market forces and direct payment not linked to production. Uh, what are the challenges for the CAP? First, you have food security, then you have employment and farm income, you have nutrition and health challenges, then you have climate change and energy use, you have loss of biodiversity, you have water quality deterioration, you have soil deterioration, and then you have dumping in the least developed countries. We will speak about it later. What are the proposals for the reforms uh, by the report? First, you need to promote a more fair framework for trade. You have used border measures to curb volatility. You need to bring back price guarantees and quotas. You need to remunerate positive externalities. And then at the end, you have to support high quality of food products. OK, now I will move to the point of discussion and debates, and I will focus on the argument of protectionism versus liberalization in the agriculture sector. So as you know that there is a new liberal case for cab reform. It was associated with the interest of agro-food fraction of capital in the 1990s. And these interests were opposing the freedom, uh, were opposing the state intervention, and they were seeking for more uh, free market where they, are, they can compete globally. And they can access to new markets for exports. However, uh, with the cap reform that were focused on changing domestic support, led the European Agriculture Commissioner to proclaim at that time, I'm quoting him, he's saying, we are saying goodbye to the old subsidy system, which significantly distorted international trade. However, on the other hand, Butter and Tlizzy says that there is a resistance actually in the European Commission for the new liberal agenda and its promotion of the WTO. And uh, this uh, European Commission of Agriculture start to emphasize on the con concept of multifunctionality of the agriculture sector. And this is really important point because the concept of multifunctionality is really focused by the European Commission and it's a concept that you need the state support in this uh, sector because it has to be dealt differently than the other trade sectors. You shouldn't fo follow the same rules for agriculture as you are doing for the other sectors. This is the most critical point that we have to stand on. Then, uh, because you have facing a lot of contradiction and a lot of pressures between some who calls for protectionism and some who calls for liberalization. And because of this contradiction, you have, for example, because you have a new state in Europe, like Romania and the other countries and Poland, and they are really depending on the agriculture the where they, you need to, um, to uh, emphasize the protectionism, wh while on the other hand, there are calls for liberalization of the trade to follow the WTO negotiation, and at the same time, because of the costly budget of the cap. So here, again, that we said, Within these pressures, again, the European Commission is stressing on the point of multifunctionality of the agriculture sector. And uh, they are saying that uh, the agriculture from its production and the trade aspects to other functions that include social and environmental concern. It refers to the development of the CAB with the uh, original focus on agriculture self-sufficiency through protection of and financial support for farmers. 
Okay, I'm quoting here uh, Pascal Lamy, he's the European uh, Commissioner for Trade, and it was in 2001. He is saying, agriculture is different from trade in goods. Partly, it's a question of externalities in a simple mod model of a profit and lose. The benefits of agriculture, such as the maintenance of rural population and rural surfaces, are undervalued. There is uh, an undeniable link between sustainable agriculture, food safety, maintenance of the landscape, and the environment. So here, he is again uh, emphasizing on the point of multifunctionality. We will see again and again that the European Commission, through many reforms, are focusing on this point. However, the discussion, okay, we need, there is an agreement that we need a state intervention in the agriculture sector. However, how far you go in the protectionism? What, what is the right policies really to uh, implement this protectionism? And if it's really helping the agriculture or not? Because the debate is not only about if you have a protectionism or liberalization, it's about also how far you go and which kind of policies that you need to apply. This is one critical point that we have to ask. So, a lot of papers were uh, raising this question is that, okay, you need to do a reforms, but what about the problem of the imbalances of world? You have, on the other hand, protectionism, and for developing countries, you have tra trade liberalization. And the report shows, and other empirical studies, which was really focused on, that it's really harming developing countries, and it's really destroying the agriculture in developing countries. This is a question that is really critical, and we have to ask about uh, ourselves, and I will be pleased more happy to hear from you about this. And then here, Casper will speak about other discussion. Yes, uh, thank you. So, um, one of the things in the paper which I think is worth more discussion is uh, the, the limitations to the common agricultural policy and agricultural policy in the uh, European Union. Um, for example, when it comes to uh, environmental goals and nutritional goals. Because uh, when, it, when it comes to pesticides and fertilizer, we can set limits. It's relatively easy for the EU to, uh, to set stricter limits to the use of pesticides and fertilizers. But I think it's slightly more difficult for, when it, for, for carbon emissions and for nutrition, because the problem is not just in production, but in, in what we eat. So I think that there's a, a very much a demand side problem here when it comes to uh, the consumption of animal products, for example. The, a, a huge part of uh, carbon, carbon emissions is because we just consume too much meat and dairy. And uh, with nutrition, it's the same story. Uh, people just eat too much unhealthy crap. That's basically the problem. And is agricultural policy really the thing with which we want to tackle this? That's um, yeah, I think that's worth a, a, a good discussion. Wh how, do we, how do we do this? Well, what is the role of the agricultural policy in this? Um, a second thing is about the uh, discussion of the, the, the butter mountain and excess supply that we have seen in, in the, the 70s and the 80s, and how uh, quotas can, can solve this excess supply. This makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and it may help against the dumping that we discussed before. If we don't have that excess supply, we can also not send it cheaply to, to uh, developing countries. Um, but there are still a lot of people in the world that are hungry. And if we look at the projections for the future, then we see that um, we might not have enough land to uh, produce enough food for everyone. Um, and it then seems strange to say, oh, let's produce less. So I, I'm sure that's also not what is meant in the paper. Um, so the real problem is how do we produce different things? Because we also discussed the trade balance um, and that the trade balance for agriculture, agricultural products is positive for the European Union. But this is measured in money. Um, that's uh, what we heard in the presentation. Wine is a big part of it, of course. Wine is expensive. But if you look at land use, it's a different story because we need all the animal fodder and a, a lot of uh, land is necessary. So how do, we, how do we make sure we don't produce too much butter, but we do produce more soy and other animal, uh, animal feed? Um, so yeah, that's something I'm still uh, puzzling with. And then I, I would like to make a link uh, between the, the agriculture story and, and uh, normal mi microeconomic theory. Now, I am not an expert on microeconomic theory, 
And I'm also not an expert on agriculture, so really this is just a discussion opener. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone else can, can say more smart things about this. But to me, it seems that the, the, the markets for primary products are markets that most resemble the, the neoclassical microeconomic market that we've all learned in our, in our bachelors. Um, there are homogeneous products, which you see in almost no other markets, I think. There is a large number of suppliers, so there's lots of competition. There are even diminishing returns, often. So I think market forces are driving prices down a lot of the time. Um, maybe the market is functioning too well, so that we get all these ex externalities because the prices are brought down all the time and that uh, farmers don't earn enough. But it does raise some questions for me. Why do farmers actually need income support if this market is actually working pretty well? Why, why is that? Well, what I read and what I got from the paper was that uncertainty is a big problem and that uh, prices are very volatile. But why exactly? I'm, I'm, I'm not certain I completely understand that. And why is the financial system not, not able to solve these problems as we all learned in, uh, in, in the neoclassical theory? Okay, then we have some, uh, to, uh, to end this, we have a, a few uh, minor questions. What is the role exactly for national policy in this? Because um, the, the, the goals that are discussed in the paper are very ambitious, and that's good. I, I think, it's, uh, I think those, that's very good to be, to be ambitious, but um, agricultural policy is one of the more controversial issues, and now that we see that the support for the EU is declining, maybe we should look at national policy too. Well, what um, can we do with that? And what I did not really understand from the paper, why are family farms so important and large-scale farms bad? Is that necessarily so? And the same for the declining employment. Of course, it's a problem, but it isn't the real problem that we can't find new employment for these people, because being more productive is good, right? So, okay, that's it. Um, now we'll give you some time uh, to uh, respond to our questions and comments, and then we have uh, questions from the other students. Ah, yeah, okay. <coughs> uh, can. I can, yeah, <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much because this is uh, really, um, uh, this is uh, very, very interesting and uh, it arose also to answer to some ideas. And um, also very controversial aspects, and but that is great. Uh, on the nutritional aspects, uh, just just two answers. On the, uh, on the nutritional aspects, uh, you say that we cannot do many things uh, thanks to the agricultural policy. But for example, uh, you can um, you know that what we uh, what we eat depends also on the prices of products. And for example, if you, uh, if you do not give subsidy for the fruits, but you give m much more subsidies for the sugar products, for example, anyway, it will allow to decrease the prices of sugar products, but not of the, of the fruits. So you can act on the nutritional aspect thanks to the prices, but you can act also on the on the um, on the products thanks to some measures. For example, in EU, this is not um, uh, this, this is not a very big policy, but we there is a, um, a costless distribution of fruits and milk products in the in the schools, you know, from the EU, and it allows to uh, encourage the consumption of milk and fruits products. Anyway, you can see that. Thanks to some measures, you can play on the on the nutritional uh, balance of the food. So, first of all, uh, second uh, point on the multifunctionality. This is very interesting that you mentioned that. 
Uh, anyway, this was a very fashioned way. Uh, <coughs> it was uh, very fashioned during the thousands years the, to speak about multifunctionality in the academic and the political uh, field. Uh, this is not very fashion now. Anyway, we speak more on uh, sustainability. That is very fashion. Anyway, but the problem is that uh, it was a very beautiful world. Uh, uh, yeah, a, a world. It was very fashion way of speaking and so on. But there were two visions of the multifunctionality. The one from OECD and WTO and UK and so on was not the same of uh, the multifunctionality of France, for example. We spoke about multifunctionality in France because we thought that for protecting uh, the, agriculture, uh, the agriculture and the other functions of agriculture, employment, environment, and so on, we had to implement a very strong agricultural policy. But the British said, or the OECD, OK, there are environmental externalities, only environmental externalities. They said the only one function that we have to take into account is the, social f uh, is the environmental function of agriculture. But for making that, we do not have to act on um, to intervene on the prices, uh, the trade, and so on. We just have to spend money for the farmers who have rotations, who have hedges, who have trees, and so on. Just like that. Some very focused measures, agro-environmental measures, which have to be co-financed by the, is, uh, the European states, not entirely by the EU. You know, so, uh, and so you, you see that, that is not the same, uh, um, this is not the same policy uh, than the, the French view, which was, we have also to act on the prices and so on, because if we make disappear the familial farm and so on because of the competition, there will be consequences on the environment and the, and the employment and so on. You understand that? So, okay, everyone is, uh, agrees on the environmental and uh, function of the agriculture, but we do not have the same vision uh, of the policy for answering to the environmental function, you know? Some of them, UK says, okay, we just need some very focused measures, uh, uh, not uh, with no uh, dis uh, disturbances, disturbances yeah, of the markets. And some uh, and friends say, okay, we have also to regulate prices, to regulate uh, volumes, and so on. <coughs> the qu the question of hunger. So, for example, we don't have to implement quotas because of the hunger of thousands thousand countries. You have to, to know that uh, every almost thousand um, NGOs uh, uh, and farm organizations of the thousand countries uh, are for the quotas in EU <laughs> anyway, because they think that the first problem for, f for the food security in southern countries like Africa, uh, this is uh, the food autonomy. How we can ourselves, uh, how we can, um, uh, how we can produce our own food. And what is the first problem in Africa is not uh, to import more products, is to develop their own agriculture. And what they need, what do they need? They need uh, very basic tools for producing. Uh, almost uh, the big part of farmers do not have, uh, for example, uh, do not have animals. They do not have machines, that is clear. But they do not have even animals for um, uh, I don't know, for having uh, in charu, <laughs> for, for, you know, for uh, making the, the work of, uh, on the field, you know? You understand? Yeah. Yeah. Blowing the fields. Yeah, roaring? Blowing. Blowing. Blowing the fields, okay. Yes. 
So this is a di uh, this and, and also there is a big problem according to this farm organization like Ropa in Burkina Faso and so, so and others. The first problem also for them is uh, preventing the dumping from EU. And for example, now there is a, a over production of milk products. And what we do with this over production, we sell it on the African markets at very low prices and they are uh, and th their farmers are in competition with our farmers, but our farmers have very big subsidies, and this is the difference. And there is here a big problem of uh, uh, unequal competition, anyway. And you know that uh, because of the of the IMF and uh, and the World Bank in the uh, in the 80s and 90s we uh, oblige them to decrease strongly their, uh, their berries for food, okay? And uh, now there is a big problem. They have very low berries, lower than ours, and uh, there is a problem of competition. And we are obliging them more and more because of uh, future bilateral agreements, that is um, uh, partenariat economic, yeah, the, the new one uh, agreement between African, Africa and uh, African countries and uh, EU. There is a, a new partnership bilateral agreement, which is uh, the Accord de partenariat économique, economic partnership agreement, okay? And this one is obliging these countries to uh, um, uh, also to decrease more and more their berries, also for food products. Uh, <coughs> the problem, so the problem of hunger, in my mind, is not a problem of uh, imports in these countries anyway, and uh, and we don't have to food all the world in EU anyway. We 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 have to help these countries uh, to develop their own agriculture. And hopefully the World Bank changed more or less its mind uh, during the last years about this, since the last uh, food crisis in 2008. So the discourse in you now in the World Bank, they said no more, uh, they say no, uh, they, they, don't, they didn't say uh, we have to uh, feed the world uh, from uh, the EU or fro from the rich countries, we have, to, we have to help these countries to develop their own agriculture. Finally, on agriculture uh, disturbances and, uh, uh, on the markets, uh, <coughs> why, we say, why do we say that agriculture is, uh, needs public regulation? There is a rigid demand face to the prices. So if the prices increase, you, 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 will, ha you will want to, uh, to, to, to have food. And so the demand is very rigid face to the prices, the food demand. Also, the agricultural offer is very rigid also. Uh, for example, with the milk prices in EU, they, they decreased strongly during the last three years, but the production increased. This is, uh, this is not logical in, in, a, in, a, in a free trade. Uh, why? Because uh, we have, re, uh, we have a fixed cost in the farms, which obliged, so investment in the machines, uh, um, in buildings and so on, and we, when the prices decrease, you have to produce more and more for covering the cost, the fixed cost. You understand that? So you know you have very. Uh, so I, I I won't explain uh, other uh, other imperfections of markets. Anyway, you have many many imperfections of markets, and for uh, I just have a little history about that. In the thirties. Uh, Ezekiel was the economist counselor, one of the economist counselor of Roosevelt in the United States, and he explained to the president all these uh, problems in the agricultural sector. And based on that, Roosevelt implemented the first big agricultural policy regulating prices, uh, especially because it was proved 
that in the agricultural markets, you have very, very big imperfections of markets, demands, offers, and so on. Finally, why the family farms? Uh, you have many studies who show that they are more environmental fr uh, friendly. Why? Because if you want really to implement the agroecology, you need humans on the farms. And uh, you need humans which are um, uh, w which know very well the farms. To have agroecology and especially organic farming, you need a very advanced uh, knowledge of your farm and of the ecosystems and so on. And for that, the family farmers, the farmers, uh, the familial farms, are much more um, efficient. You know, and finally, uh, many studies show also that, for example, in France and the EU, uh, the the employment is very um, is uh, you have much more employment in the little farms. So, if you want to preserve employment and environment, you need to preserve family farms anyway. I don't speak about capitalist view uh, against uh, and so on. I just want to say that if you want to respect environment and employment in the farm sector, you have to preserve familial farm. And I just want to finish with that. Now we have a big... Uh, EU is um, perhaps in a very crucial period because the familial farm are disappearing very quickly. And there is a big development of what we call the firm, uh, the firm uh, enterprises, the firm agriculture, an agriculture which is more and more capitalist. You know, that is the disconnection between who belongs, uh, to, to whom belongs the earth and uh, the farm and uh, who works on the farm. The familial farm, this is a way of farm, of of farming, of producing, with the family uh, we, uh, who works on the farm and the farm belongs to the family. But now there are more and more capitalist farms. The capitalist farm belongs to financial guys, to uh, uh, insurances, uh, to, to uh, agro-industry and so on. And there is a manager with uh, salaries, okay? And this kind of farm is growing more and more in EU, especially in the Eastern countries, uh, in Romania, in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine and so on, outside the EU, in South America and so on, but also um, in France, huh? you have more and more capitalist farm. And uh, so, it farms do, do not belong anymore to, to the farmers. And this is a very big question. Do we preserve the familial farms and how? Perhaps this is the last sector here, one of the last sectors where we, we, we do not have a capitalist economy at the, at the level of an enterprise. We still have a familial way of producing, but this is very changing quickly. So. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, questions? Uh, is it okay if we do um, collect three questions and then you answer? Yeah. Those? yeah. One, two, three. Hello, thank you for this uh, presentation. It was really, really good. Uh, I, I have many uh, comments and many questions. I, uh, uh, I'm Italian. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, the first question would be uh, what do you think uh, of the TTIP? Mm -hmm. And uh, so its implication on the food uh, safety. Uh, then uh, I would like to, to comment uh, further on the uh, um, effects of the animal uh, in industry on the uh, and uh, environmental issues, and uh, which are the policy implication of uh, that. And uh, uh, finally, uh, as I come 
uh, from a um, part of Italy where uh, s small farming is uh, still uh, uh, fundamental as we buy food from uh, uh, farms and not from shopping mall. Uh, how how do you see uh, Umbria? It's uh, a region in the uh, center. Cumbria. Umbria. Uh, Umbria. Yeah, it's okay. in the real center of Italy with the hills uh, and the lands. So <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I uh, want to ask you uh, if you see a future for this kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. small farming fa or uh, if if it's going to end and we uh, will just go to shopping malls as all the others do. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, my name is Maria. Um, I'm from Pakistan. I just wanted to ask you because you highlighted in your presentation and when you were while talking that now the reforms in the developing countries should be in terms of moving towards an agriculture policy instead of importing food. But just to highlight a bit, there was a case study being taken place in uh, mm -hmm. Pakistan in Ayub Khan's regime. What happened was um, a, a kind of a green economy project took place in Pakistan in which they, because Pakistan is a very agricultural country all Natural. over the world, one of the most agricultural country in the yeah. world. So uh, they tried to move um, uh, all the reforms to the agricultural sector in a way that they introduced the chemical pesticides for the first time in Pakistan. Earlier there was very organic farming in Pakistan and mm -hmm. people didn't use agri uh, chemical pesticides. Later on, it actually increased the productivity by six folds. Yeah. Like it was one of the massive, massive productivities. Mm -hmm. Like we actually had a surplus produced for coming 10 years, yeah. but it actually spoiled the lands in Pakistan. With that, the um, agriculture reforms that took place, that uh, they made the uh, bourgeois and the um, uh, feudals more uh, powerful and they tried to own the land more because they were treating the pe farmers as laborers after that when these policies came in front. Now people are quite retaliating because these policies still exist and land has been deteriorating. In 2010, Pakistan has been one of the countries w w w where the climate change was the most effective yeah. in a way. Sure. So I want you to highlight these things like because if we talk about agriculture policies, it's not just introducing someone with a new chemical uh, yeah. pesticide, but it's about the organic farming that that we are doing. Just stick, stick to it and how to move forward with it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luisa. I'm from Option A Innovation. Um, I'm from Brazil. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is regarding food waste uh, and hunger. Um, I would like to know um, like, um, the tools such as uh, GMO and pesticides. Uh, precisely, which are the real dangers for health and environment? And GMOs. Yeah, yeah also GMOs. pesticides. Yeah, yeah. and, and okay. which are the real um, dangers that they have and to what extent to, uh, to what extent they actually are useful for increasing uh, production and enlarging the life of the products. And um, also, like, just a comment on uh, waste, uh, because uh, in Europe I know a party that is called La Tomatina in Valencia, in Spain, and this is like a party where uh, people uh, waste uh, tom tomatoes by throwing it, mm -hmm. and yeah. I'd like to know what is like, <laughs> <laughs> how is it seen, and if, if there, there is like any attempt of like uh, fighting against this uh, party, uh, which in my opinion is a huge waste. It is nice for the city because it attracts a lot of uh, tourists and attention, but at the same time it's uh, a huge, huge, huge waste. And... Um, Sorry, which is a huge waste? So, sorry? Ah, oh, yeah, La okay. Matina. Okay. In Spain, it's in Spain. Oh yeah, and in Italy there there's the same kind of party with oranges. <laughs> 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 and 
And also, uh, if there is any uh, kind of policy to reduce the meat consumption, uh, considering that uh, this is like one of the sectors that also has the uh, most negative yeah. uh, environmental impact. Yeah. I, I did not speak about that, yeah, okay. <coughs> I, I, I am doing that. Hmm. Very interesting questions. Yeah, uh, big debates <laughs> about the meat consumption, perhaps. Uh, first of all, um, yeah, ob I, I obviously I think wh when you when you have knowledge about the problem, you you, you obviously think that uh, we have to decrease our consumption of meat. This is, or at least not in all the world, but at least in uh, the parts of the world. Uh, where the consumption is very high, in the United States, in the EU especially, because if every human on the planet uh, eats like us, this is, uh, we, we need uh, five or six planets. For so we cannot say, oh, Chinese, Indians, they want to, uh, uh, they want to, 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 to eat meat, uh, uh, this is not acceptable. Uh, <laughs> Ah, we, we just have to, to reduce our consumption of meat in the countries where this is a problem because we are uh, at, at level which are not sustainable. Plus, uh, studies, medical studies are showing that there is a problem of, on health. Uh, we, can, we, <laughs> we eat too much eat, uh, meat in, uh, in EU or, or in United States. But I, th I don't... I am not against uh, livestock. Uh, in in a many so um, so I think the problem is that there are two extremes position. One position is uh, we eat what we want and so on, but there is another position which is uh, we have to uh, prevent all meat uh, consumption and so on. But in many parts of the world, you can only produce meat or animal products because in the mountain in very uh, uh, <coughs> uh, disadvantaged areas uh, only animals can uh, can be produced or animal products can be produced you know so you can say that if we prevent every livestock in the world uh, it will uh, it will uh, resolve the problem, plus we need organic matter for fertilizing the crops anyway. So there is a complementarity between crops and livestock, but we have to reinvent this complementarity for reducing the chemical fertilizers. So we need organic matter on crops, you know, and we need crops for feeding the, the animals. But we need certainly to change the way of producing animals. So we need more grazing, we, we, need, we need more grassland, and we need to change or to, uh, to change uh, completely uh, the way of feeding the animals with maize, with soya, and so on, and to return to the grassland when, where we can, and uh, to the grazing anyway. <coughs> on GMOs and pesticides, which consequences? Anyway, there is a big controversy in, uh, in the scientific uh, field. But you know that in European Union, we implement the principle of precaution, contrary to the Canada or to the United States. And here, in the EU, European Union, in the treaties, and that is a good thing, we have the principle of precaution. That is, if there is a, controvers uh, a controversial view in the scientific field for the health, the, the health of humans or of animals and so on, we need, to, we need measures to prevent the consumption of GMOs, for example. That is why we do not accept uh, the production of GMOs in EU. We accept the consumption, but not the production. Okay? But the problem is that we import many, uh, many GMO products. And what uh, and the farmers say now, or the main trade farm trade unit, what do they say now? 
they say, well, uh, this is not fair because we import GMOs, but we do not have the right to produce GMOs. <laughs> so that's why there is a paradox, you know, a contradiction. And about the pesticides anyway, and uh, glyphosate and all the chemical products, this is not a controversy now. You know that the, the UN and the uh, uh, Health World Organization, they now acknowledge that uh, the pesticides and glyphosate, for example, uh, have uh, put risk on, on human health and there is a very big risk of cancer, 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 cancer. <laughs> and this is now acknowledged by, um, by, the, by the UN anyway. So on my mind, this is very clear. And the problem of GMOs is that the, the most of the GMOs are used for allowing the use of herbicides, you know? Most of the GMOs is, uh, they are for uh, uh, producing, uh, for being resistant to the herbicide. Oh. Yeah, and to the glyphosate, anyway. So that is why there is a link between, a direct link between GMOs and environment, anyway. We do not use GMOs uh, for uh, fighting against hunger or so on. Monsanto, Bayer, they use GMOs for selling also the glyphosate because GMO is resisting to uh, the, the GMO plants uh, are uh, able to resist against the glyphosate. So you can use the glyphosate on all the, the, the crops, you know, on the wheat, on the cereals, and they resist to the glyphosate. You understand that? This is most of the surface of GMO plants are for resisting against an herbicide. That is. <coughs> and, the, and the last problem of GMOs, and India was victim of that, this is uh, the endowment of the farmers. Because when you, um, Pakistan also, I think so, yeah? <coughs> and th there were many resistances from farmers against that. Because of the GMOs, uh, they had to buy GMOs every year because we, with a GMO plant, you cannot make reproduce your plant on the farm. You have to, uh, to buy the plant every year. And, and the prices were very high. And uh, the yield was not as high as planned. So uh, it was uh, an additional cost for yield which were not so, so good. And there were suicides of many farmers and so on because of this. So the problem is also the autonomy of farms. And I just want to answer to you about the, which agricultural policy. You are right. The problem is that if you implement uh, an agricultural policy which, which uh, and this is very interesting in Pakistan, India and so on with the so-called green revolution. The problem is that now we see the impacts of this revolution. So first of all, it was focused on uh, just a few parts of farm, very big farms. The little farms were not into the green revolution anyway. But this one which used irrigation, uh, for example, the, uh, now in India you have a big problem of, of water yeah. because uh, <laughs> there is no more water uh, in the soil. And the first victims are not the big farm which has, uh, have a big uh, uh, des puits. <laughs> Roots, uh, no. Storage, yeah. Water storage, okay. Uh, for having water from... Uh, <coughs> Red, Weds. Weds. Yeah. yeah. So these big farms, uh, they can um, they can have water be, uh, thanks to the machines, mm -hmm. but there there is no more water for the big, uh, very little farms. Mm -hmm. And we, I, I, one of my students made a study in uh, in India. It is awful for the very big, uh, very little and poor farms problem of pesticides and so on. Now there is problem of quality of soils and the yields are decreasing and so on. So what, we ca what ca can we do uh, now? 
I think that we can implement really the agroecology. This is a way uh, which leads to the autonomy of farms. The, the first objective is the autonomy of farm. Autonomy from uh, the fields uh, uh, of machines, uh, pesticides and so on. And uh, autonomy, but also um, progress in, uh, for the yields thanks to the ecological systems. For example, uh, you use rotations which are um, which, uh, which uh, very intelligent rotations of crops, for example. Uh, we use some hedges or trees which you know will be good for the, for the crops and so on, so you know. And now there, there are many progress of the agroecology, but this is not uh, this is not really carried by governments and because of the firms also. There is a big lobbying from the firms which do not, which want to, to sell their products. They don't want autonomy of farms. They want to, to, to sell chemical products or organic products. Anyway, they want to sell their products. And uh, I mean, the, the real agroecology, the first objective is the autonomy of farms. Finally, about um, small farm. What is the future of, of small farms, especially in Italia and so on? I think the risk today in Europe is the specialization of two kinds of farm. Perhaps 10% of the farm or will be very little farms uh, with direct sales uh, in the farms, organic farm, uh, uh, quality products and so on. Okay. But most of the farms will evolve towards big farms and uh, a capitalist farm and so on. And on my mind, this is the main problem. So 10% of products and of consumers will have the right and we, we uh, will be able to consume very healthy products from local farms and so on. But the rest of the consumers and the rest of farms will be uh, oriented towards this uh, productivist uh, agriculture and capitalist agriculture. That is, um, on my mind, the main risk. This, uh, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, anyway, that is clear. Uh, but I didn't speak about uh, Brazil, Latin America, and so on, where there is uh, all these little farms are completely uh, um, uh, Menacé, ah, uh, are, com are, are really um, uh, endangered. Anyway, and I know that in Brazil, for example, with a new government, uh, all the policy towards the family farms is uh, now destroyed. There was a, an attempt from uh, the government from Lula, of Lula, and then uh, of, uh, and of the two last presidents to. Uh, develop the policy towards the family farms, at least, uh, uh, at least one part of the policy. But now the new government is only uh, implementing one policy for the agro-business, uh, and that's all, for the very big farms which export, and not the, ve the family farms. And um, I think uh, now there is, a, yeah, there is really a, a danger for these family farms in Latin America. And I mean, the, I think, uh, I know that the development of capitalist farm is really more uh, advanced in your country than in the EU, that is clear. In EU, we have still, uh, most of the farms are familial. But I know that in Brazil, or in Argentina, most of the surface, most of the area is now uh, for the capitalist farming, that is clear. So, yeah. <coughs> At TTIP, I will answer to that after, anyway. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Eric. I come from the Philippines. Um, we have a very vibrant uh, agricultural sector. Sure. Um, I want to thank you for the presentation primarily on your focus on promoting for targeted subsidies towards small farmers. However, um, I'm not convinced with the whole call for price regulation. Um, to some extent, we've implemented something like that 
in the Philippines for rice, which is our staple food. Yeah. And the reasons for me not being convinced come from a few reasons. One, because price regulation was highly politicized yeah, and was primarily used for rent-seeking behavior, not only from institutions, yeah. but also from politicians. Yeah, so, it, I that. Yeah. so over time, it just became an yeah. instrument to seek votes of farmers yeah, who, yeah. who knew uh, little about how they're being played at with the whole price regulation. Number two is that we have a neighbor, they're called Singapore. They don't have any uh, farming land whatsoever, and yet they're one of the most food secure nations we have in the region. And I'm having a hard time trying to reconcile uh, food security with agricultural autonomy. And mm. the whole agricultural autonomy is again, a highly politicized um, call that yeah. I've seen play out not only in our country, but also in Thailand and, and, and Vietnam. So yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure about, then the other thing is, can you clarify on your call for border measures? Because yeah. I think that's related to customs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And again, at least from what I, we've seen, that's another politicized thing yeah. where countries have used the quotas in order to increase smuggling rates and also at the same time to sell at the black market. And then lastly is on the things you've mentioned about GMO uh, just now. Oh, sorry, no, let's skip that. I'll go to the um, things you've said about the uh, capitalist farms. Mm -hmm. And I'm not fully convinced about going against the capitalist yeah. farms because I think there's a way there's a middle ground where these farms can work actively with small farms in involving the small farms in inserting themselves within the value chain. We've seen at least that the most productive partnerships and most um, egalitarian setups we've seen are those wherein the capabilities of the household farms have been enabled through a more... Um, uh, equal exchange with capital capitalist farms in the Philippines, in Thailand, and in Vietnam. So I'm not entirely sure about the whole Europe situation, but mm -hmm. for for what we've seen in the presentation, I think it just is contradictory with what we're seeing in our area. That's it. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm Jelena, um, option A, and I come from Serbia. Um, first, what I wanted to make some small comment on, your general, uh, thank you for your presentation, but I wanted to say that regarding the new news in the world, it seems like we are getting a bit better, nothing is that, that black, because uh, we yeah. are developing some, as you mentioned, some of the new rotations of the crops, and also some of the uh, better ways of not spreading um, the pesticides on the entire uh, lands and stuff. As you know, we are now spreading the pesticides from aeroplanes because it's easier and they're developing some new innovations yeah. uh, because I know this because in my country we are really trying to stick to the to come back to the regional uh, farming with innovations and I wanted to make some comments about, uh, about the some things I heard from our discussants uh, first about not enough land that is also said in a paper mm -hmm. I'm not sure we're looking at that um, in a good way because in, even in my country there is a region which is not employed uh, in it's not used in the land at all and that region itself if it's used can feed the entire population of Europe so I mean maybe with the innovations we could switch not to destroy even our our lands and also about the, you mentioned the, the products are uh, homogeneous. I think it's much complicated than that because yeah. I know uh, I've been in his country, he's from the Netherlands, and I've tried, for instance, their fruit, and it's nothing like the, uh, the fruit yeah, sure. like from Italy <laughs> or from Eastern countries, so it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, I mean, in, in general, it's more complicated than that, and it's yeah. the costs are much uh, difficult subject in this because it doesn't cost at all the same to produce, for instance, roseberries. Serbia, it's one of the biggest it's the biggest producer of roseberries in the world. In our land, 
after the, if you take a project on small farming, after the second year, you get 200% of profit on that. So the, it's easier for us to produce it with a, uh, less cost than for other countries. So I mean, the, some of the countries have been accused also for dumping in this way, but the, it's just complicated for us. It's cheaper to produce it than sure. for other countries. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask a question regarding to what Jenan mentioned, the other discussant, about how uh, these policies of the European Union hurt these countries that are developing still. For instance, there I have an example from uh, practice about this. Um, uh, we produce also a lot of apples and we export them mostly to European Union. Apples in Serbia cost one kilo and the farmers probably get back, the small farmers probably get back 50%. When European Union imports this because of the competition laws and stuff, we have to go down and down with the price. The farmers are paid five cents for kilos of apples. So I wanted to ask you, did you research on these uh, bad sites that Gerard mentioned, how these uh, policies Im impact uh, the other countries outside of EU? Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Adga, I'm from Indonesia, and I don't know that much about the farming landscape in French, but on my way here on the metro, I pick up the C News Matang newspaper, and, which is available for free, amazingly, and it has this article <laughs> on agricultural landscape of France that quite piqued my interest. Yeah. Uh, what piqued my interest is that it says that, on average, a farmer in France actually earns only 1,525 euro per month, but what is even more striking is that almost a third of them only has less than 350 euros. And it's kind of it kinda striking for me because it's, it's, it's French. Is it the real data? or <laughs> I, just, I just don't understand how it can happen. But it also suggests to me that there is a big, there is a big range of uh, diversity in the, in the structure of the farming landscape here, which kind of implies yeah. monopoly or different oligopolistic st structure in the farming industry of the French industry. And it kind of also makes me suspect that the small family, the small farm family, they might be they might be below this average rather than above this average level of income from farmer. And for that, I don't know whether that's true or not. But I would like your interest. Uh, I would like your opinion on that. But still, even if they are above the average level, it doesn't seem like a good way of living, to be honest, for me, because they doesn't earn quite a well amount of money. Well, of course, money is just one thing to have a good life, but that's still one important thing. And in fact, 50% of the farmer here says that they do not recommend their children to be a farmer as well. So it kind of yeah, sure. seems to me that. Well, it's not really the best way of living for the next generation, maybe. Mm. So my question related to that as well is that, isn't it more efficient and also maybe lead to a happier life if we, rather than we uh, defend the small farms, the small family farm, just for the sake of preserving them, but rather to also promote the big capitalistic farm because they employ the most efficient means of production, perhaps, and perhaps they, they also do the dirty work, so to say, that not many of the people want to do anymore. I would like your opinion on that. And maybe if, if it, is it also correct to say in the, in, the, in the case of French or maybe Europe in the wider context that the big capitalist <coughs> farm is more efficient in it, more cost efficient in this regard? And how would that figure into the, European, in, into the food security issues? Thank you. Thank you very much. Plenty of questions. Yeah, really, really thank you for all of this. And this is really interesting to have your feedback from different countries. And I see that you know also your agriculture in, the, in your country. And that is great to have this written. And um, uh, first of all, I did not answer to the question of TTIP. Um, yes. Uh, anyway, uh, I am very critical against every bilateral trade agreement. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, but I was not the only one. Uh, for example, you know, for the agreement between the free trade agreement between Canada and uh, EU, European Union, there was a report from experts nominated by the French government, which was published in September. And uh, this agreement, uh, this report said that it was uh, that it uh, there were very um, there will be very negative impacts on agriculture, on European agriculture especially, and especially on familial European agriculture. 
because uh, it will uh, make it will decrease all the berries, the custom duties, okay, and it will uh, decrease uh, strongly also at or at least it will make pressure on the environmental and sanitary measures. Um, I, I have not the time to precise it, but anyway, this is not, I do not say that. These experts nominated by the governments had this conclusion. And uh, this is the same with the TTIP, perhaps in a, on a bigger scale. Uh, now with Trump, we are, perhaps uh, we do not, we won't have TTIP just now, but anyway, uh, this is still uh, on the table, that is clear. And as we, uh, as, as we liberalized many things uh, into the agreement towards uh, um, between Canada and EU, the fact is that the United States will ask to us the same as for the agreement with the Canada. So that's why um, I think we must be worried about that, at least in the agricultural sector. And the French, you, you have to know that the French deputies in the European Parliament, the deputies from France in the European Parliament, vote in the majority against the agreement with the Canada because of the agricultural impacts. This was the first, uh, the first reason. Um, Secondly, uh, yeah, you say that anyway, w it is not so black and uh, okay, um, but I show to you that on the environmental aspects, yeah, we can say that one little part of the agriculture is making more intelligent, intelligent rotations and so on, agroecology, okay, but if you look at the Global indicators, we have less and less grassland area, and this is decreasing progressively. We have a biodiversity on the farm, which is strongly decreasing. And this is a, uh, this is a very big point. And all studies, you know, bird life and NGO, environmental NGOs have now very good experts on that, and all reports, and also from ecological scientists uh, are very, um, <coughs> Uh, are really showing that uh, the biodiversity on farms is decreasing strongly because uh, because hedges, trees and so on and uh, lakes and uh, little lakes on the farm and so on, all of these elements are decreasing on the farms also. And so, you know, you have all these indicators which, which are not good on a global scale, even if one little part is making progress. And um, on the capitalist farms, uh, some of you said perhaps they are, why are not the, why, why not capitalist farms? I just want to react on what I know from Ukraine and some studies in Ukraine, Russia and so on. The problem of these capitalist farms and also from um, Eurogrey, uh, I have two, three studies in my mind. What it show is that the, Added value is, uh, is, uh, is, is uh, lower in the capitalist farm. The, the added value per worker and per hectare. Okay? Uh, why? Uh, uh, so the added value is lower, but it allows to give many profits to the capitalist, uh, to the financial. Uh, uh, guys and uh, to the uh, to the capitalist anyway, because the objective of this kind of farms is to distribute capital capital profits in a short on a short term, and many times the the earth don't belong doesn't belong to these guys. It is located because they know that they will use way of producing which are in a very short term. In five or ten years, they will um, they will uh, epuise, they will exhaust the earth, they will exhaust the the, nitri the nutrient uh, uh, elements of the earth and so on, and five or ten years later, they will go for another land, and this is a problem. This is a short-term view, 
And in the agricultural production, you cannot think in a, a short term. All your earth and your, all your ecosystem is dead in, in 10 years, in, in 20 years. That is why they, 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 they do not uh, buy the earth. They just have a, 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 a contract of location, you know? With little farmers, we, we, which are obliged to, to rent their, their earth because they do not have the choice, you know? This is a case in Russia and Ukraine and so on. So I think the first point is that, is the problem of the short term view because of the profits of the capital. And finally, um, the competition and the, I am, um, I totally agree, they are very different cost of production according to the region. That is why when you, when you led to, you, when you have in competition every farmer in the European space with very different cost of production, because if you are in the mountains or if you are in the, in the region of Paris, you don't ha do not have the same cost of production for the cereals anyway. But you have the same price and you are on the same market. Uh, if you do not have a quality uh, sign or something like that, you are on the same market. And that is the problem. So if you open the competition, for example, as I know that in Serbia you have many little farms, which with uh, in mountains especially with. Uh, I don't know Serbia very well, but I know Kosovo because I I had students in Kosovo this summer, and I I, I, I traveled to the Kosovo for uh, studying the 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 farm, and uh, the cost of production are so huge so huge because so huge because they do not have our machines, they do not have our, our chemical fertilizers and so on. This is in the source, this was in the source of Kosovo in mountains and okay. But uh, if they enter to uh, into the EU, they will have the prices of the EU. And that is what happened to the Greece. I know quite well the, the history of the Greece. When they entered in uh, 81 in EU, they were a net exporter towards the, e towards the world. And after the entry, they became net importer. Because uh, in cereals, milk, uh, cow milk, and so on, they have a much higher cost of production. Plus, we have a common agricultural policy which do not subsidized very well the, the agriculture of southern countries. We, we, we have subsidies which advantage the production of northern countries. So, you know, because uh, the CIP was imagined where, where, when we were six member states uh, without Greece, eastern countries, and so on. That is why uh, I know Serbia is candidate and so on, but that is why I think for the new candidates, the new en entering in the EU, there, there is really, uh, you really have to think about this. Anyway, and what happened to the Greece, for example? Now, Greece has to import many products for, for which they were autonomous before. And uh, they are now specialized in uh, olive oil or in uh, I don't know, but before they had autonomy in cereals, in meat, and so on. Now they make uh, they make milk for fet for the feta, uh, the cheese, the feta, and the olives, and uh, some of products. They are specialized, but they import many products, and they are net importer. Finally, and uh, last word. Um, ah, the farmers in France. That is the question, and. Uh, how the conditions now and uh, are they really poor and uh, so on, that is. Uh, the last crisis in the milk sector, you know, since uh, three years, you, uh, there, was a big decrease, uh, there was a big decrease of prices in milk sector. And this is very interesting because everyone was victim of that, especially the big farms with big investments. Because they invested for big volumes, they have now uh, big debts 
for having uh, the new uh, big machine uh, and so on. And they were the first victims of the decrease of prices. And the only ones which uh, managed to maintain the revenues or to, to maintain them quite, uh, quite good, this is in the organic farming because the prices are good, in the quality products like uh, Conte or Beaufort, I don't know if you know it, uh, the cheeses, which are very good. And uh, also farms which had very low cost of production thanks to the grazing and uh, because they do not uh, buy uh, soya and uh, maize and so on. And finally, it showed that uh, the farms with uh, uh, grazing, autonomous ways of farming and so on, which did not have big investments in the last years, in machines, uh, in food, in uh, animal food, and so on, these farms managed to pass the crisis. And this is very interesting because it showed that uh, big farms with uh, big machines and so on are not perhaps the, the, more efficient, uh, the more efficient farms in case of crisis. Anyway, uh, I hope I, I showed you that big capitalist farms and so on are perhaps not the more efficient to answer to the stakes in the future. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for your intention. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there still were any questions. <laughs> ah, yeah, do you, do yeah, you still okay. have time for ah, yeah, a last round yeah, of I questions? I did not know or? that. Okay, that's great. <laughs> I, I have time oh, if you want. More. Okay, two questions. <laughs> Um, about the, your argument on the uh, capitalist farm, uh, what I find that is a bit interesting is that there is also a literature uh, about the added value of uh, worker per hectare that is actually saying that, especially for the developing countries, yeah. um, why this ratio is so low is that often it's uh, more working hour for the mm -hmm. workers and yeah. often un unpaid work. Yeah, um, yeah, sure, yeah. And that this would increase the efficiency uh, because actually you have women working for no wage, children working. Um, so I was interested in to, um, applying this critique to the context of Europe and see how it's different um, mm -hmm. and how, because I, I do believe that indeed small farmers also uh, are very precarious and that often they even have to take other jobs in order to survive. Um, so this situation is kind of re a, a strong contradicting evidence uh, for, for this, um, but for the context of Europe maybe it's quite mm -hmm. different. Um, and uh, also I was curious to know maybe if you can comment a bit more on quotas in the context of liberalization and trade. Um, I'm from Canada, uh, yeah. I'm from Quebec, so obviously <laughs> yeah, sure. it's kind of a big topic. Um, yeah. But yeah. I don't know exactly in the context of Europe and would be interested to, to know more. Uh. Hello, my name is Vinicius, I'm from Brazil, option C, development oh, and finance. Uh, it's kind of related question, more or less. Uh, there's there's a bunch of uh, there's a nice literature coming from SOAS, uh, with the work of Carlos Oya and Kramer, mm -hmm. that they talk often about uh, the harms of fair trade in uh, small and agricultural farming. And for me, fair trade, especially in, here in Europe, is just like a new fashion as uh, sustainable and mm. farms are. But this literature uh, uh, talks about how, in, especially in the case of coffee plantation in Ethiopia, how uh, fair trade actually harms uh, labor and uh, wages are actually lower than oh, yeah. normal oh, yeah, uh, small like farms and uh, uh, big plantations. Oh, yeah. So uh, maybe you what could comment. What is the name? Of I the can send it to you. It's okay. kind of, yeah, oh, yeah it's very easier. interesting to Yeah, it. and uh, maybe you s have something to comment on that. About the fair trade. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay, I can. <laughs> very, very, very curious group. Uh, no, just I uh, come from Argentina, mm -hmm. and there in universities, we are seeing this big. Um, 
shift also in the way we teach these mm. these uh, classes with a very pro market vision. So uh, before yeah. in in agri like what would, would be our agri tech, uh, it was all about uh, farming mm. in a low sc a small scale, and now it's all yeah. about like global value change, international. Uh, yeah standards and how to you know uh, even make things easier to these capitalist firms so how is it my question is how is it in Paris Agritech? in the studies in the studies yeah. uh, in lessons and so on yeah if, if you see this change in the in, in, in the, the way, way they teach, of teaching yeah. instead of yeah. seeing and, and discussing yeah. these issues we're talking with you if it's moving to a very different okay. way of teaching yeah 15 Oh yes, that's fine. Ah, uh, I answer to you? Okay. Uh, the way of teaching. Uh, anyway, in France, I can say that uh, I think the familial model is still uh, the one who is politically correct. This is not correct to uh, defend the capitalist farms anyway uh, in the agronomic universities. So we didn't have this change now. I don't know is the other universities. What change, what is sure, is the discourse about the, the market. So we say that the familial farms are great and so on, but every, not every economist, but most of the economists say that uh, market is great and we must deregulate and uh, all is fine and uh, there is no problem and yes capitalist farm is just a little part and, uh, and so on and they don't link link the, the, the real changes and the policies uh, we are conducing in, in Europe and uh, that is a problem there is uh, no recognition of the of the shift in the farming and the big, uh, the big evolution uh, of the capitalist farms uh, in Europe. Uh, anyway, the about the fair trade, uh, I think uh, also that is not a solution anyway. Uh, I think the only one solution will be uh, protection. Uh, as if we want, um, anyway, if we want to protect our social rules and so on, we need to protect ourselves uh, um, against the products which are not uh, uh, respecting these rules, you know? And that is why I am really for the whole localization of activities of, uh, for example, uh, I, I support with others, uh, with, uh, with many others, the fact uh, that we must uh, favor local products in the school meals and so on. And uh, I think also that we must let the southern countries uh, to protect them. S the problem is that, uh, for example, with uh, economic partnership agreements, we are obliging many 50, con 50 countries of the south to open their berries uh, for, all for all export food products, you know? And uh, yeah, I think that uh, the first uh, tool is to, to let uh, all countries to protect themselves for their, for, for their agriculture, for protecting their agriculture. And uh, in the EU, we can see that in France, for example, we have a big problem now because we have a cost of work, you know, uh, working costs which, which are higher than in Spain or in Germany. We have also environmental rules which are a little higher in some, in some aspects. And uh, we are not uh, as uh, competitive as the others. So what do we do? I farm, big farmers say now we have to decrease our environmental constraints for being competi competitive. And so, I mean, if we really want to respect, to, um, to respect our social and environmental rules and so on, there is no other way. Uh, we, we, must, uh, we must protect ourselves. At the European level, if we are able to, uh, 
uh, to make it at the European level and to have environmental and social constraints at the European level, or we will have a problem being in, the, in this EU anyway. And this is the same for every country in the world. Uh, so, fair trade, I, do, I do not very well anyway the fair trade, and, but I, I read some papers also on the negative impacts and so on. There are also critics on Max Avlar, for example, in France, because uh, it also uses uh, big supermarkets. And, uh, and because, anyway, you accept the rules of the big supermarkets with all the conditions of working in the supermarkets and so on. So this is a, another critique uh, against it. Um, anyway, um, but I, I do not share very well this critique anyway, but because I think that supermarkets, you, if you want to, to sell it to, to social classes, certain social classes, you have to sell your products through the big supermarkets anyway. That is the same thing for the organic farming. Anyway, this is a big debate, and I don't want to, uh, to precise it. Um, on the quota, uh, yeah, I think Canada is the last one country I know with quota in the milk sector, in the poultry sector. Uh, I think uh, that uh, your system is really endangered because of the bilateral agreements with EU and the TTP, Transnational Partnership. Uh, trans yeah. And uh, because what, what happens now? Uh, for example, for EU, we will sell to you uh, much cheese at, uh, with, very, uh, with uh, big subsidies from EU, and our cheese is uh, more competitive than yours. <laughs> no, but just, just in a way, just in a way that we have big subsidies. No, it's a way of being competitive because we have big subsidies for our farmers. You know? <laughs> no, no. I just, I, do, I don't want to say that our cheese uh, is better than yours. I just want to say. <laughs> I just want to say that we will be uh, very crude, crude uh, competitors <laughs> because of our direct subsidies, because uh, we have uh, big familiar farms with, uh, 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 with 100 cows, with big machines and so on. And uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I think you will have to import more, really more cheese from EU. The problem is that you have quota and uh, that you have uh, quota with a guaranteed price. So how do you do with your price, which, we, which is very high, and all prices which are very low? You will, be, uh, you will be in competition, and I think your system is endangered. That is the rule of the free trade. And I mean your system, I think, is very, very efficient. Because it's, uh, it's, with it's like the common agricultural policy before uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. With uh, guaranteed prices, quota, and so on, uh, directed towards uh, the, the domestic markets. The familiar farms have quite uh, good incomes, thanks to very stable prices at a decent l uh, level. So that is great. But the Canada is signing many agreements, free trade agreements. So this is completely contradictory with your system. And unfortunately, I think your system is endangered. That is uh, yeah, the lesson of uh, the free trade. So if you open your barrier, you will, you will have problems with... Uh, you cannot uh, stay with... Uh, you cannot maintain guaranteed prices, quotas, and so on. You have to protect the berries, and unfortunately, the Canada did not make it with the free trade agreements. So that's why the Quebec is, uh, with the, which have the, the most efficient system, uh, I think, uh, will have problems anyway. But you're, uh, well, okay. And finally, um, with the capitalist farms, yeah, uh, capitalist farm, you are right. Um, maintain an added value not so bad 
Thanks to the salaries, which are very low, you are right. And some, uh, many times, you know that these capitalist farms, they have, uh, so in the studies, this is very well shown, uh, they have <coughs> uh, paid, they have workers with very low wages because workers have do, do not have the choice. They were farmers before. Uh, their land was uh, bought by, uh, by these capitalist farms and they do not have the choice, they must work for these capitalist farms. So they accept very low wages. Th there are studies like that in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, for example in Ethiop Ethiopia, which uh, bought um, a big part of the land to China and uh, Arabia, uh, yeah, some of countries from Middle East, I think so also. And uh, now these workers in Ethiopia, they were farmers be uh, before. They have no land anymore and they are obliged to work at very low wages. So. And secondly, uh, they also paid very low uh, rent to the countries and very low rates. Some t they, they managed to obtain many times very good agreements with the states, with the southern, uh, with the government. For example, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, oui, yes, yeah, that's fine. They, um, they, the government accepted for having money in the short term, they accepted to buy land to uh, China, uh, China funds and uh, China uh, and uh, Middle East funds and so on. They bought lands to these countries. They sold. Oh, sorry. They sold la land to these countries, and these countries, um, these countries, uh, for these funds, uh, do pay very low uh, taxes and very low rents. That's, it's clear. So that's why uh, they have. Uh, uh, they are quite, they can maintain them thanks to these low wages and these low taxes towards the countries. But finally, the feedback towards the, the country, the southern country, is, uh, is very negative anyway. That is clear. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah, on these capitalist farms, uh, there is a big, uh, uh, there, there is a big literature. There, uh, this is controversial. You, you can find also literature which say, oh, that's great, and so on. Anyway, uh, when you really study precisely how it functions, how it works, uh, the impacts are quite negative, I think, for the local population and for the state. That's it. Uh, so sorry to be so negative, but anyway. <laughs>